mindset. Well, today I'm going to talk about, well, today I'm going to share tips which I think will help you succeed in incorporating earthworms into your experiments and open your mind to the possibilities of collaborative soils research. I think it's wonderfully fitting that earthworms are making a comeback. People seem to have forgotten that science existed before impact factors. For example, Charles Darwin recognised that people's observations mattered and for 39 years people wrote letters to him about their earthworm observations and he combined their insights with experiments ignited by his own curiosity to write the book on earthworms. 150 years later, we now have digital knowledge networks to bring us together. So perhaps you, like me, think this is an exciting time to develop new ways of working. I've split today's talk into five minute sections to upskill your earthworm knowledge and highlight how each and every one of us can influence the trajectory of regenerative agriculture. Now, I'm reasonably confident that I don't need to describe what an earthworm is to all. If I was talking about tardigrades or calendulas, it would be a different story. But earthworms have curious cultural importance. People know what they look like and generally like them for their role in soil fertility. Over the past decade, research has demonstrated that earthworms influence the susceptibility of plants to pests and diseases. And when you see a plant from a different perspective, from this rhizotron, for example, it helps us to visualise the role of the soil ecosystem to plant health. The soil ecosystem is engineered by earthworms. Here's a photo that a farmer sent me, and you can see the permanent vertical burrows, burrows that can persist for 50 to 60 years, creating the architecture of that soil uh, where plants are grown. Now, take a moment and look away from your screen and look at the walls to your left or up at the ceiling at the solid constituents of a room's architecture. The important part is the voids this um, engineering has created, the open space. Everything happens in this open space. And we often visualise soil as a solid, but it's the open space, largely engineered by earthworms, where the chemistry and microbiology of soils happens. Yet experimental conditions have been normalised to exclude earthworms. Uh, you can see the difference one earthworm has made to modifying the physical properties of this pot experiment with wheat. Earthworms increase water infiltration rates by up to 10 times. It brings water and soluble nutrients down the soil profile. Burrows increase soil aeration and plant rooting depth. What you can't see is the chemical and biological properties of the soil ecosystem, such as making the uh, phosphorus and nitrogen more readily available after passing through the earthworm gut. They eat around one and a half times their body weight per day. But these are just sort of somewhat forgettable generalizations. The key thing you need to know about earthworms is that there are three types uh, grouped by their feeding and burrowing behaviors. If you look at this picture, you can see the three types of earthworms and they have different burrowing behaviors. In real life, if you poured latex on a soil with a functionally intact earthworm population and then dig it out, this is what you'd see. Uh, it highlights the voids in that architecture now, the surface worms would be in the pancake layer. They're weak burrows and make little impact. The frilly parts expend, extending into the topsoil, these are the patches made by the topsoil worms. Um, and the reason they're frilly is because they backfill their burrows with worm casts. And then those long tubes, they're made by the deep burrows, also known as drainage worms, which connect the soil surface to the water table. Now, it's useful to know your earthworms because I've got a little test for you in about 10 slides time. Uh, and so you need to know beyond burrowing that they have different feeding behaviours. Now, earthworms trend towards litter feeding or soil feeding. The deep burrowing earthworms are litter feeding earthworms. And here's a, a picture of them gathering that plant debris into a pile called a midden. And Charles Darwin thought this was for two purposes, one, to help maintain the burrow microclimate, and two, as a, a ready source of food. And that food supply is frequently inhabited, inhabited by the surface worms, which feed on the plant material. Now the endogenic worms are over on this side. These are the worms that eat topsoil. They're backfilling their burrows as they go. Um, this is time lapse shows. Now, knowing the different types of worms is important because soil feeding earthworms suppress diseases like takeall, whereas litter feeding worms suppress diseases like fusarium. And in terms of diseases, a nice example uh, comes from a study exploring aphid reproduction. And it was found that the earthworm presence would, uh, decreased aphid reproduction by 21%, which was linked to uh, influencing plant capture of litter nitrogen. The study also found that aphid reproduction was much higher when litter, when earthworms were excluded. 
An indirect example I can share is that earthworms are an important source of prey for many animals, from birds to beetles. And beetles are an important aphid predator and control agent. So a diet which included earthworms increased beetle fecundity, with the authors speculating that the loss of deep burrowing earthworms, Lumbricus terrestris, could lead to the breakdown of biocontrol through the loss of predator fitness. However, the role of uh, earthworms is somewhat complicated because earthworms may decrease the plant, plant resilience to aphids. Could this be because of their role in nitrogen cycling, which increases the susceptibility of plants to aphid attack? Could this be a decline in plant chemical defences by disrupting the salicylic acid pathway? These are fundamental gaps in knowledge. So to best include earthworms in future studies, I have a few top tips. Uh, Ideally, you need to you stick on Velcro around your plant pot rim, else earthworms will have a tendency to escape into the greenhouse. Something I've noticed is that people exploring earthworm aphid interactions seem to use earthworms that live in garden compost heaps, not the important soil dwelling earthworms, the epigeics, endogeics, or anesics. Most will need collecting from the field, except Lumbricus terrestris, which is also called the lobworm and can be found in bait shops. Now, you're not necessarily going to find this earthworm Lumbricus terrestris in the fields because earthworms are tillage sensitive. And, uh, and if you look at this ploughed field, you can not only see the habitat disturbance, but the loss of the litter layer. That litter layer is the food source, the habitat, the microclimate for two of the three types of earthworms. So continuous tillage changes the earthworm community structure and can lead to local extinctions of litter feeding earthworms. Now, there is a presumption that earthworms are everywhere, but many fields do not have litter feeding earthworms. I'm at a conventional tillage farm at Rothamsted towards helping people know about the soil biology beneath their plant experiments. And the blue, uh, the blue is where there are functionally intact earthworm populations and the orange is where litter feeding earthworms were absent. But earthworm mapping isn't particularly common. Earthworms are more intuitively sensed. And I say, try it for yourself. Give you a few seconds to rank the likely earthworm populations in these pictures. So we're going from left to right, from low to high uh, earthworm populations. The picture on the, the far right is from a Canadian farmer using minimal disturbance. And you can see the birds have lined up um, in the disturbed soil area. Then we've just got plows being followed by seagulls. Um, but then sometimes there are no, very few birds or no birds at all. And this is when people tend to get in touch with me about changing things. So the biggest change that people can make to their farming practices is conservation agriculture. And conservation agriculture has three principles. Firstly, it's about not disturbing the soil. The second principle is to have permanent organic cover on the soil surface. And so you can see from an earthworm perspective, we're having an undisturbed habitat, improving the food, the litter supply and that microclimate. So it follows that people are seeing improvements in earthworm abundance. Now, seeing a change is very powerful. For feelings, not figures, guide most of our actions. And earthworms do have this global cultural significance. People associate them with good farming, with soil fertility, with being sustainable and improving soil health. And in Europe, these beliefs sustain their adoption of conservation agriculture, even if productivity or yield declines, because they perceive they're doing the right thing. And this phenomenon was also recorded in Brazil, where conservation agriculture was adopted 20 years ago. And farmers adopted the earthworm as a symbol of their farming clubs, not calemblins, not bacteria, not the tardigrades, but earthworms. And this suggests that earthworm monitoring is a high leverage behaviour. Now, conservation agriculture is not a top down policy. It's farmer led and farmer spread. And 20 years of social psychology and rural psychology explain the process um, through identity theory. And to get straight to the point, adopting new practices reconstructs beliefs and values, resulting in new rituals and new symbols of success, which sustains behaviour changes. It's farmer led and farmer spread soils management, which means policymakers and scientists are encouraged to anticipate its adoption. This means we may need new research approaches, particularly for disease management. And there's little influence of science in these systems. For example, farmers were interviewed by social scientists and the feedback was less than flattering. I feel disengaged with the science community. They don't understand complexity. Another farmer developing their regenerative agriculture said, farmer to farmer learning is a powerful tool. Whilst there's a lot of science paperwork out there, but it's on a shelf somewhere. Now to better engage with regenerative agriculture, 
it's useful to understand it as a social learning network. People collect ideas from their network, whether it's Twitter or farm events, forums, science papers, and they experiment and adapt the ideas to their local context. Learning comes from planned experiments, but also unplanned experiments. Planned studies are usually split field designs and adoption is incremental from part of a field to the whole field and eventually, potentially to the whole farm. The regenerative agriculture movement is a concept and that concept is about restoring uh, soil health or reversing biodiversity. So it's not conservation agriculture, although conservation agriculture can be lumped in to regenerative agriculture. Its decentralized structure means that information and misinformation is disseminated. However, it's a dynamic network of sharing and the pattern is to learn, to test, to use, to engage and to learn. And delivering on the promises it what is what creates trust and network spread. So to work in these new knowledge networks, there are three question structures you can use. What are behaviours of people using, uh, what, what are people using to inform their behaviours and earthworms are used to inform their soil management decisions? When does this work and when is it inappropriate? Well, that depends on local context and that's uh, farmer and advisor decisions. And how can science aid decision making? And that's about building the capacity for expert behaviours. It's a bit like building the Large Hadron Collider, creating the capacity for giant experiments. Now, observations of birds are all very well, but if we could aid decision making through science, it could be helpful if we had the same method uh, so we could share and compare results, normalize replication and build expertise. And so I ran the idea through Twitter and other digital networks and people joined in voluntarily, highlighting the significance of earthworms, um, that people are willing to spend a few hours digging in their fields to discover what was beneath their feet. It was a lean design approach with a minimum viable method. And it was clear that people need a lot of support to improve their earthworm identification knowledge. So we created, created an online earthworm quiz to help. So just for fun, I thought we could test your knowledge so, how many adult earthworms can you see in this picture? And I'll give you a few seconds to decide. So, the answer is one. There's one adult earthworm. It has the saddle, which is the thickened ring near the head. And only adult earthworms can be identified visually. So now you know what you're looking for. Have another go. And the answer is, again, one adult. And it's the only earthworm which has that thickened or coloured ring near the head. So now we can identify the adults. We can move to the different ecological groups. Here's a picture of some earthworms I dug up in a field. Are they surface worms, topsoil worms, or deep burrowers? And I'll give you a minute just to read the descriptions and make the decision. So they are topsoil worms, as you can see, they're pale or green in colour. And they're the most ubiquitous worms we have in our soils because they're soil feeding. And finally, how would you record these results? So here's a picture. So first of all, how many, do you, how many adults do you think there are? And then can you identify them into their different ecological groups? The answer is there are three adults and there are two topsoil worms, the green one and the pale form, and we've got one deep burrower. And that's how you'd record the results. And the earthworm survey and identification support was used and useful. And digital communications enabled it to be the first globally coordinated earthworm survey. And different people using the same method, the same observation in every continent except Antarctica. Now, knowledge networks need to be functioning, helping people to acquire the skills, trusted connections so we can leverage knowledge of each other, but science partnerships are needed to build that capacity to use and apply knowledge in context. And it was this capacity building where I had a total disaster and a complete roadblock. The worst thing that could happen to a scientist happened to me. I faced unexpected hostility from the soil science community from this initiative. So I conducted a questionnaire to find out what they thought was wrong. And the problem was, is that they didn't consider uh, they could trust farmer's data unless there was a photo uh, to verify the information. And second, so that's why they didn't think the data was very useful. Uh, nonetheless, they thought it had value. 
I thought it would improve soil health and would recommend it to farmers. So instead of moving forwards into natural science experiments, I had to take steps backwards to adapt the method uh, to meet researchers' needs for capacity building. And it seemed like this could be resolved with a photo image for them to check. But of course, we need to move from this to something like this. Uh, we need a scale bar, a pale background, and ideally the size of the soil pit that earthworms have been extracted from. But how do you motivate people to take photos of earthworms. So I conducted two experiments. Uh, first one, I provided a booklet um, with a, a photo template in round three. And in round four, I added just a written method instruction, but no template. And the results showed that people don't really take photos of earthworms, which is a challenging situation. So I mulled on this challenge. And in the end, I created this fork wrap. And here is the prototype. If anyone would like one, please let me know. Uh, it's a tactile neoprene fabric wrap, which uh, wraps around a fork or spade so it's ready for sampling at any time. I ran a colouring competition and a young chap called William designed this rather lovely border which serves as the colour correction. The grid is the scale and we've got the soil pit size written on it and everyone will be using it on World One Day in a few weeks time. The feedback so far has been quite encouraging. People like them but don't want to get them dirty. So hopefully I'll be able to share the outcomes in the um, upcoming Advances in Soil Biology event in December. Now, in terms of capacity building, that's as far as I've got so far. But what I'd like to say is that litter management is a key challenge and collaborative earthworm research is likely to be very productive. But a picture is worth more than um, a thousand words. So I want to play this short 20 second video. So conservation agriculture and regenerative agriculture are exploring permanent soil cover, which protects the soil from erosion, but we can anticipate an increase in disease pressure of fungal plant pathogens. Our disciplines are directly linked. Soil biodiversity influences uh, pests and disease pressures and ecosystem engineers, the earthworms, are potential bottom-up controls. Now, the scale of this control has been estimated the Lumbricus terrestris, that anisic deep burrowing earthworm, which I showed videos uh, of collecting straw at the beginning, has an economic value of 75 euros per hectare and theoretically half fungicide use. This requires sophisticated knowledge on the part of the farmers and advisors. But now that we're building that, that capacity up, we have the opportunity to apply natural experimental approaches and widen the interventions beyond those amenable to planned experiments um, to identify causal relationships. Now, focusing on this species is a great entry point for collaborative research. Uh, earthworms make these distinctive middens on the soil surface, which can simply be counted. And you can count them within fields to have an idea of the density across a field. But you can also know which fields have these earthworms or um, in them versus fields that have a high number of these earthworms. 30% of surface areas can be covered by middens. And we're starting midden mapping with Base UK, the Conservation Agriculture Group in October. Now, this sort of idea is inspired by a decade of laboratory research by the Oldenburg, Wolfarth and Schrader group in Germany, and I'm going to share that with you now. So firstly, Lumbricus terrestris prefers contaminated straw over uncontaminated straw, and the first graph shows a nice comparison between these litter feeding earthworms versus the soil feeding earthworms. Um, which, um, these litter feeding earthworms are decreasing infection potential and don amounts. And this field finding built on laboratory research, which discovered this phenomenon was linked to an improvement in the nutritional quality and digestibility of the straw and stimulation of the microbes, which degrade don. However, it is crop and fusarium species specific. Uh, this is an important question because, all this, because of the spread of the different species, but Lumbricus terrestris doesn't universally and um, Lumbricus terrestris doesn't universally suppress fusarium species growth. However, earthworms do consistently in, uh, increase mycotoxin degradation. So generally around half for Don and a third for the other two types of, uh, of mycotoxins. 
Now, since 2021, I've noticed there have been heaps of studies further confirming the role of earthworms. For example, Lumbricus terrestris has improved reproduction outcomes when fed on infected straw. Another litter feeding earthworms have been found to be effective as biocontrol agents. Um, I've coloured them in, in pink here, the different species that have been found to date. And whilst the soil feeding earthworms don't have a direct role, they do seem to in work with the other soil fauna working together. So with that, I'd like to bring my talk to an end. And I have a few questions for you. What's holding back collaborations in earthworm pest disease research? And what information do you need from soil scientists and farmers to, work, to move forwards? And do we know enough to put in interdisciplinary proposals now? Um, and from my perspective, if working together with people's observations and insights with our analyses and experiments, it should be possible to help shape the trajectory of regenerative agriculture together. So thank you very much for listening and I welcome answers to my questions and I'll try and answer any questions you might have for me. Thank you.